And I will never say my parents were not good with money just like that, but just they were never taught. That is the truth, right? If you're not taught something, how are you expected to know? Um, but the truth is that at a young age, I saw financial challenges and I was like, darn, right, I need to do something about this. Literally, you know, when I was 10, I made myself a promise. I'm going to buy them their first home because we did not have a stable home. We had to move sometimes every few months, sometimes every year because um, rental expenses would go up and they couldn't afford that. And so, and by the way, it is because my parents put any money they had in our education. And that helped me to go to a brilliant school. I went to MIT. My brother went to MIT. My sister studied undergrad in Puerto Rico and then went to Harvard um, for a master's. Wow. So we all, you know, went to really good institutions, academic institutions, thanks to my parents saying, you know what, we might not have a wealthy lifestyle around, but my kids are going to get the best education because education is freedom. Hi, Envisionaires. Welcome to the Envisionaire podcast. This is the podcast where we envision living our best lives filled with unlimited possibilities by exploring everyday topics related to health, wealth, community, and love. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered to be medical, legal, tax, financial, or other professional advice. This podcast does not encourage or endorse any illegal activity. We are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liability that may arise from the information in this podcast. The views explored in the podcast may not always be those of the host. On this episode, we are going to be speaking about the wealth pillar of the podcast as we have Anna Orenstein Cordona, who will be speaking with us about the importance of getting into an abundant money mindset in order to start building wealth. After graduating MIT, Anna embarked on an impressive 20 year financial career working on the trading floors in global financial institutions, covering some of the largest investors in the UK, the US, and Europe. And in 2020, she transitioned to entrepreneur when she founded Wear Your Money Crown, a dynamic financial education firm committed to bridging economic disparities through innovative, heart-centered educational initiatives. She now coaches and empowers individuals, entrepreneurs, corporates, and educational institutions to learn about financial education and achieve their alt optimal financial wellness. My hope with this episode is that we will reflect on our own money blocks and feel empowered to start working through these so we can truly be empowered to start putting on our own money crowns and adapt an abundant money mindset. So a very warm welcome to Anna. Thank you so much for being on the Envisioner podcast. Oh, thank you, Nicole, for having me. I'm so happy to be here and excited for this conversation. I mean, this is such an important conversation. And I talk about this. We, I hear it from the listeners. I talk about it with my girlfriends. This idea of financial literacy and the idea of, you know, we, well, we hear it now. I think it's a lot more mainstream. We talk about the importance of, you know, you hear it everywhere. Investments, asset management, um, you know, various different classes of investments. And everyone's like, how do I actually do this? And why do I even have to do it, right? It's so easy to bury our heads in the sand. So why do you think, I think it'd probably be a good start, actually, if we start with why do you think we need to care about having an abundant money mindset? And what is a money mindset to even begin with? Absolutely. So there's um, quite a few elements that start very simply with what is mindset, right? And mindset, as I define it, is the lens through which we perceive and through which we respond to the world around us, right? So it's going to shape our attitudes, our beliefs, and our approach to challenges. Mm. And so if we think about it in relationship to money, it's exactly going to be the same. Our money mindset is how we are going to approach um, money, what our relationship is going to look like. And that is going to set basically the tone for our individual financial success and mm -hmm. not only ours, but the generations to come. And so how I also like to think about it is that our thoughts lead to beliefs, right? Our beliefs then are going to guide our actions. Mm -hmm. so if we don't fix our thoughts around money, the repercussions are going to be that our actions are not going to be in alignment with, A, what we want to achieve in life, and number two, with our values. Mm -hmm. 
100%. And so that is how I define money mindset in general. And so when we look at um, growth mindset or abundance mindset versus scarcity mindset. So scarcity mindset is believing that something is limited, right? Mm -hmm. um, believing, for instance, that money is a finite resource when money can actually be made in so many different ways. And in fact, even when we think about it from an economics point of view, there's what is called money supplies in um, the economy, which is where the central banks and those that make money create money. But the truth is that every day a bank lends money or an institution lends money, they are making money too. And so money is not finite. Mm. Now, an abundance mindset, on the other hand, is literally having a positive outlook in that you have the opportunities to earn and grow your money, mm -hmm. that you have the opportunity to build that life you want by looking at things with gratitude and setting yourself into the right financial goals that will lead to the right actions. Yeah, absolutely. And when you talked about this idea of thoughts turning to... Did you say thoughts turn to beliefs then then turn to action? Is that what you? That's right. Yeah. So with thoughts, how are, what, where do these thoughts come from? Are these thoughts, are these like the external programming that we get when we're children? How, how are these thoughts developed around money? Yeah. So in general, there's something called transgenerational money beliefs. And those are beliefs that we as adults, right, have picked up from a childhood from a, um, variety of sources. Number one is our parents, right? Or our mm -hmm. guardians in our youth. Yeah. The other one is going to be societal norms. But also we have culture, we have religion, we have education, such as schools, we have the peers that we surround ourselves. So I always like to think of our mind, right, um, as a supercomputer. And so it's literally, we have what is called the subconscious, and we have the conscious, right? And mm -hmm. in our subconscious, that doesn't turn off, right? That's on 24 hours. So everything we're picking up from childhood, all those, I I like to say not only the visual cues we get and the verbal, but what we see and observe, all mm. that is kind of in our subconscious feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. And so if 95% of our thoughts, and this is actually based on scientific studies, 95% of our daily thoughts are subconscious. Imagine the impact those thoughts are creating on our beliefs and mm -hmm. on our actions. Yeah, that's fascinating. And how, so how, if, if it's obviously built based on like our families, culture, where we grew up and so on, how do we start addressing those? Like, how do we start becoming aware of them and whether they're like, it's, it falls under like abundance or versus scarcity. <laughs> and then what do we do when we actually say, oh yeah, okay, that's, I gotcha. That's a scarcity. Now what? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is what I um, do with my clients and in the work I do. Um, as a financial educator, part of my training was what's called behavioral finances. And that's where we combine psychology with economy. And we really try to understand, okay, what makes people make certain decisions that aren't really in sync with what is in their best interest, right? And then that's a whole other field where we can get into what are cognitive biases, right? Mm -hmm. um, which are basically patterns, strategic patterns of thought that we have, again, based on anchoring beliefs, um, overconfidence beliefs and other types. And I'm happy to, to go into that. But really, let's talk about action. And this is what I do when I work with people. I want to understand a person holistically. I am, I am really holistic in the way I approach finances, meaning that I want to understand an individual strength I want to understand their values and their beliefs. And above all, I want to understand what is their higher purpose in life? Because I am a huge believer and I am a woman of faith. I, I say God, people might say universe, but we are here for a reason. Mm -hmm. Whether it is to create impact and legacy ourselves as individuals or to make a little person who will do that <laughs> in the future. I really believe we all have a higher purpose. Yeah. And so finding alignment with that higher purpose takes time because we weren't really taught that, right? We weren't taught mm -hmm. to think mindfully, to act mindfully, to think about, okay, what are your values and beliefs? And so for me as a holistic financial educator, I want to align your financial behaviors and goals and actual money objectives with 
with all that and combine it. And so one of the first things I would say is identify your money story. And by money mm-hmm. story is, again, think about your up bringing those past experiences because not everything is from childhood there are things that we pick up in university there are things we pick up through relationships with different individuals right and that impact their mindset impacts our mindset and our actions there's definitely cultural influences and so what is your money story meaning close your eyes and when you think about money I want you to think about it visually like what color is it what does it look like how does your body feel does it feel open and expansive or does it feel like it's shrinking, right? And I want you to think about the first thought you had around money. And sometimes those thoughts are positive. When I work with individuals, sometimes they're beautiful first memories. But 90% of the time, they're really sad and negative memories. And so it's about addressing that and transforming your money story, saying that is no longer me and I am going to make the positive changes. And so then what do you do? You're going to challenge those limiting beliefs. So just as an example of a limiting belief could be something we heard in childhood saying, we can't afford that, right? That's a very common one. To saying, I may not be able to afford that now, but what are the steps I could take to afford that in the future? Right. 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 That's the transformation. And so once you identify your money story, start to challenge those limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. And a word I use a lot is the word yet. So when I'm working with someone and they go, oh, I'm terrible at money or I um, I'm not good at math. And that's why they think they're bad at finances. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's introduce the word yet in your life. Meaning. So, for instance, you know, I'm not good at money yet. Yes. I haven't learned, right? And so once you um, follow those steps, I want you to think about what is your why for wealth? And by the way, we all define wealth differently. So if I can ask you, Nicole, what do you define wealth as? I think now, now, only recently, because I've been doing a lot of research into financial literacy, for me, I would define wealth as as time, freedom, Mm -hmm. freedom for time. So I used to think wealth was... just explicitly money, like denominations, quantity. Um, But now I actually see it a little bit more holistically because it's like, what would this afford me in terms of time, which would then lead to a freedom in a way. I love that. Absolutely. So, you know, when I think about wealth, it is absolutely time is one of the biggest assets that we have in life, right? And one of the biggest assets that the more we have, well, the more we can dedicate it to those people, individuals. Um, I'm a big animal lover, so I always include fur babies in the equation, right? What can we do to create that impact? But for me, wealth is really about the fact that you feel whole Mm. and that you feel the economic freedom to make the choices that align with your higher self. Right. So I always say money gives you power to say no to a bad job, a bad boss, a bad relationship, a bad situation. So Mm -hmm. for me, that's wealth. Right. So that is why I want to have wealth. Yeah. And so when I um, ask people, I want you to define your wealth and then answer why do you want that wealth? That's when we really know, okay, we have our North Star. So now we're going to set those financial goals that again, have to be in alignment with your values, have to be in alignment with who you want to be, how you want to express yourself in life. And then we create an action plan. So the action plan of the actual things like, you know, okay, working on the money levers, making sure that your income is more than your expenses, making sure that your savings ratio is healthy, all those things honestly are pretty easy, like ABCs. And that's something I teach as well. But most importantly, we got to work here because if we don't work here, we're not going to get the output we want. A hundred percent. Okay. So there's so many like questions that are popping into my head now because you've given us so much information. Okay. Let's get back. The trans, what did you, transgenerational, generational money beliefs. Yeah. Money Mm. beliefs that feels very deep and feels very hard almost to overcome because when it prompted my own, my own thoughts about, because I've been learning about this sort of intergenerational trauma in different areas of life, not just, obviously this is one other component where we can explore that, which is so interesting, but also like physically in terms Mm. of like disease and so on. And, you know, anyway, so that's, so for example, my father, um, they, uh, they, my dad's Chinese and they, uh, grew up, it was, I think he was born in China, 
And that was in the 1940s when Mao, the Mao government took over and they had a factory, a shoe factory that were very, you know, seemingly well, well to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and all of a sudden he's like under the age of five, I think fled, they all had to flee. Mm -hmm. Everything was taken away. And then all of a sudden he moves, the family moves to Trinidad and Tobago. And, uh, that's where my family is, is basically from in a way. Um, and so they grew up there, but then again, very, like very, very humble, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm had to share like a can of sardines between eight a family they that sort of and I know you as I know you yep. yeah you're from Puerto Rico so mm -hmm. I know we have a little bit of the Caribbean connection there yeah. um but yeah so I feel I feel like that sort of history it mm -hmm. really affected him he never really talked about it um but I know that that affected him and his behavior up until you know when he passed and I guess that's, it just feels very, very difficult mm -hmm. when, when that is so deeply rooted. And yeah. then all of a sudden, I mean, I didn't, I guess, I don't want to say thankfully, but I didn't get that same idea of like a scarcity, everything's scarcity. But I, I wonder like how, how, how do we fix that when it's so a huge part of the history of the family, maybe mm -hmm. the culture. Yeah. And I, there's so many things that prevent us from being able to just, say, okay, I've accepted it. I'm going to change it, period. When let's say your family is still a big influence in your life or your mm. culture, like you live in a society where it's bad to like, mm. you know, to have money. Like it's seen as very, it's, it's bad. It's disgusting. It's, you know, it's yeah. really, so how do we get over that when it's so deeply rooted? Right. Right. Okay. So there's, um, a few things I want to say about this. Number one, absolutely. Um, if an individual grew up in times of economic suppression or political uh, turmoil, the impact that is going to have, again, on the external environment, right, is going to be huge. And our external environment predicates a lot about our internal environment, okay? Our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, etc. Sometimes there are things in life that is beyond our control. And not sometimes, many times, right? And I'm saying that as, you know, tragedy can strike, famine, for me being from the Caribbean, natural disasters that have big economic impacts, right? Um, that underlying then will lead to fear and vulnerability. But you can still have total control of your internal environment. Mm -hmm. How many people growing up in extreme poverty are still internally very happy. And this looks at, um, you know, if you look into history at um, indigenous tribes, for instance, I was reading a study um, recently that, for instance, despite the external environment, right, and the decisions they have to make in that moment, they think about the decisions they make and the impact it's going to have for seven generations. Really? Whereas in today's, uh hmm Whereas wow. in today's society, a lot of us think about other, our generation, and perhaps if we have children, the next generation, they're not as forward thinking. And so again, it's about create, taking that external environment and saying what is okay to keep and what mm -hmm. is okay to let go of and building yeah. our boundaries, right? And that is super important. And why does this all matter? Because this is actually going to impact our happiness, again, impact our thoughts and impact our behaviors. And so if you take someone who was born like um what is what is the generation that's younger than millennial called uh gen z gen z yeah okay so you take a gen z now let's just look from a perspective of when they were born and what the markets did right mm -hmm. and when you think okay let's say um in the 2000s right uh it was actually until the economic crisis the uh great economic crisis in 2006 7 it was a bullish market. Everything around them was rising, right? Okay. And then the market collapsed and then recovered massively, mm -hmm. massively where interest rates were historically kept low. Credit was easy, you know, it was easy to borrow. And so what's interesting when I speak to individuals, even in, in, in Wall Street that um, were traders during this time. So let's say as children, they entered into the workforce when the economy was booming, they didn't understand how to deal in 2023 when the Fed and the Bank of England and central banks around the world were ratcheting rates higher. They didn't yes. understand why the impact on bonds and equities was so negative. However, people like me that had been through the late 90s, 
through the tech crisis and then the great financial crisis. Then we had the Greek crisis and European crisis. I've learned to deal with that. So the, yes. even though the external environment in those economic situations is perhaps negative, yes, you can control the internal environment and that will help in your risk-taking decisions, which mm -hmm. impact your finances. So I guess you really need to dig deep into yourself to understand and honestly open the conversation. Like you said very wisely, well, what do you do if your family, you're still very close to your family, but their thoughts are impacting you? Well, I invite you to have these reflections with them to understand, yeah. hey, um, let's say, uh, mom, why is it that you say this about money? Tell me about your childhood. What did grandma say about money to you? And start to heal those wounds. Right. Oh, fascinating. I love that. And then presumably you can also do some other work on your, like on your own, for example, with someone like yourself, a coach that can help you work through your own money blocks, money stories. Yeah. Yeah, and, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, it's like, again, if you want to really get healthy in 2024 and you want to go to the gym and make sure you do, you hire a personal trainer, right? Uh, or maybe a nutritionist, or you take the steps to really get there. Um, in my role as a financial, and I'm glad you you mentioned that because a lot of people are like, well, what does a financial educator and coach do? Are you yes. a financial advisor? And so this is the difference. I am I am not because my um, I don't have any products to sell. I don't earn fees for managing money. What I do is I empower you through education and give you the choices and give mm. you that um, ability to see yourself holistically from mind, I say from body, from soul, from finances, make it tangible um, to help you learn to manage your money on your own, to mm -hmm. learn to make better financial and economic decisions. So do you offer like sort of programs where you're um, doing like I see it's one-on-one -on -one group coaching? Is that what you yeah, offer? I offer yeah. different uh, ways to work with, um, with me. So for instance, I have one-on-one -on -one work that I do where I literally, um, I have a signature program that's four months and I work one-on-one -on -one with people on all the most important pillars of financial wellness, which includes everything from money mindset to cash flow management, to estate planning and to retirement and investment planning. And for instance, I tailor everything. So if you're a parent, um, I will tailor it. So you include your kids in that plan. If you're a dual citizen, which I deal a lot of my clients are dual US UK because we have really complicated taxes. So I work with them and I help them set up, you know, their A team, meaning the accountants. I work with the accountants. I really help them understand what they're saying. I act almost like as a trans later, <laughs> Taking, you know, the, the, the money lingo, I'm putting it in normal terms. Um, and right. then I have a group coaching program called rule your finances Academy. And that's a three month, um, hybrid program. So you have online mm -hmm. lessons and then we get together every week and I have hot seats and live coaching. I answer your questions and I bring in also masterclass experts from cryptocurrency to doctors again, because that's very holistic. I want people to understand what financial stress causes on their body to journaling to vision board experts. And so, um, wow. those are the ways. And then I, you mentioned corporates and schools. It's because in 2023, I expanded to work with corporates on, um, building tailored financial wellness programs for their employees and with schools and universities for their students. So right. I really believe that the younger we can start financial literacy and empowerment, the better society will be. A hundred percent. I agree. I agree with you. I don't know why we're not teaching it in schools like as a mandatory yeah. course, but um you touched on something in, in one of the topics that you do discuss, which is how it can help, how can financial stress affect the body? And can yeah. you kind of just give us an, a, a little overview of how it does affect, affect oh, the body? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So before answering that, I want to share an interesting study, which um, I had mentioned when we first jumped uh, uh, on the call. And this is just, to, again, I want to, I want to put the picture of how our thoughts and our mindset affect our health mm. and our finances. Okay, so um, there's an amazing neuroscientist called Ellen Langer. And in 1980s, she decided to really kind of put this thought of, okay, how does the mindset affect aging and health? And so she took a group of men that were in their 70s. And she had two groups. The first group were men in their 70s that were put to live in this beautiful house in New Hampshire in the US. 
And they were basically given an environment that recreated their lives 20 years earlier. So we're talking about a study done in the 1980s, and it took them to an environment like in the 19, late 1959 slash 1960. So that means that they had black and white TVs. They had um, vintage radios. They had magazine and books all around them from that era. Okay. And they had no mirrors. And they had photos of these gentlemen from when they were that age. Okay. Oh. So imagine that's the external environment. They are vividly living in that external environment, right? Yeah. And from the minute they walked in, they were immersed in that world. So for instance, there were stairs in this house and they were told, we're not carrying your luggage. You need to carry it. Even if it's like shirt by shirt, <laughs> you know, these, these men in their um, 70s from <laughs> 70 to 79 walked up, you know, with their luggage. And were put in that environment for a week. Now, before being put in their environment, they their cognition was studied, their blood pressure, their weight, their height, like literally their vision, their flexibility, everything from a scientific perspective. Okay? Yeah. A week later, they redid those tests. Yeah. People were taller. People from independent judges that were shown before and after pictures said that they looked younger. Their vision had improved their vision. Wow. Isn't that just mind boggling? Yes. Their flexibility had improved. Wow. And so the mindset shift that came from thinking, I am healthy, I am young, I am in my, you know, um, if they were 70, so 20 years younger in their 50s, had an impact on the physiological changes of their body. Wow. The control group, on the other hand, by the way, they were just told to reminisce about those times. There were still improvements, but they were not as remarkable as the people actually put into that environment. So what I want to share with you, because this leads really well into your question, is that our external environment impacts our mindset, which impacts our physical health. So if we have an external environment where money is negative, where there is... um not an abundance mindset where it's always about scarcity, 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 then that is going to impact our mindset, which is then going to have the same physiological changes that we saw in that study, right? It's that impact. So financial stress causes migraines. It causes stomach issues, ulcers. It causes um, people to lack of sleep. And as we know, sleep is one of the important things that we need as human beings. It also invites people to overindulge on certain types of food to boost their boots, uh, boost their mood. Sorry. Um, it involves people overspending because they want that quick solution of feeling well. And then only later, pay the financial consequences by getting in debt. Yeah. Which then causes stress. And so to give you um, a statistic that was for me mind boggling, but people who are in debt have suicidal thoughts five times more than the average person. That is massive. There is a super intrinsic link between money and mental health. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to put that into the perspective about, okay, what can I do, right? So mm -hmm. listeners out there, you and I, what can we do to our external environment to improve that in order to help improve our internal environment? And so again, when I work with people, we talk about through things like gratitude every morning, starting your day with gratitude. You know, I love journaling. I think it is so healing. Yesterday, I had a lot of feelings around something that was happening in my personal life and impacting me. And I sat down and I journaled and I felt cleansed after those 20 minutes. And then I already started to envision, okay, I know what actions I need to take to help in this personal situation, right? And so the same with our finances. I want you to really start the day with gratitude. And instead of thinking, oh, I don't have money for that, it's like, I have a bed. I have a ceiling. I have food mm. to eat. I have water. Oh my God. I go into the bathroom. I turn this thing. I have running water. Like, especially for me being from the Caribbean and again, suffering from natural disasters where like Hurricane Maria in 2017 took away our water for six months to a year. Believe me, to this day, I give gratitude for water. And wow. so when we start with that, we're starting to, and this is again, based on scientific studies. And I want to just share something because I don't think we mentioned it, Nicole. At MIT, I studied brain and cognitive sciences. So for me, as a financial educator, I am passionate and know a lot about um, the impact that our, again, cognitive abilities and even from a neuroscience perspective has on our finances. Um, and also, I, I study a lot on the latest research in order to keep in touch. And I have to tell you that when you start to make those small changes in your thoughts, you're actually causing new neuronal pathworks to develop, which is called neuroplasticity. And you're actually able 
to physically change the way your brain is working and all those feel good, you know, hormones and everything your body is going to be releasing. So, you know, starting the day with gratitude and really kind of self and visualizing things is very important and tangible in order to create the change. I, I mm-hmm. hope that answers your, your question. 100%. I mean, I think that's so fascinating. Gratitude and visualization mm-hmm. and visualizing the change or visualizing where you want to be with regards to money, for example. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, what other steps do you think that listeners can take when they actually want to start building, let's say, their wealth? So let's say they've moved past the money blocks, okay? And they're mm-hmm. like, I'm feeling good. Um, now I actually want to, you know, start empowering myself to start building wealth. What do you recommend they start doing? Awesome. So it's, um, analyzing where I am now, and there's some really cool financial health ratios that can help us to understand that. But more than, um, anything, I like to talk about money levers because it's a visually, um, easy thing to understand. So in life we have basically when we manage cash flow, we have various money levers, right? We have the income lever. We have the expenses lever, we have the debt lever, we have the savings, and then finally we have taxes. Again, I'm quite passionate about being really tax efficient because I'm all for paying taxes, but I don't want to overpay my taxes either, right? Um, And so when we think about those money levers is to think of them on a board and think, okay, how can I play around with these money levers in order to improve my financial situation? So again, for me to understand where I am, I want to understand where I am in those money levers in my income, expenses, taxes, savings, and debt. And so that's the first thing. And so, for instance, if you find yourself heavily in debt, I want to understand what kind of debt is it? Because not all debt is bad, right? There's good debt and bad debt. And by that, I mean, and I'll just give an example. Good debt could be something like a mortgage, which you are buying an asset that is anti-inflationary. Usually it uh, has capital appreciation potential. It's an asset you can borrow against in the future more if you need once it's paid down. It's an asset that you can rent out a room and make some passive income, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have bad debt, which frankly is credit card debt. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to preface this with something, and this is really important. There are seasons in our life, including in our financial lives. And when I was young and I graduated MIT, even though I went into a job on Wall Street, it wasn't a super high paying job and Manhattan was and still continues to be very expensive. So I did have to use a credit card to buy suits for the trading floor, right? To mm-hmm. to actually move um, to Manhattan. And what I did was then create a debt reduction plan. So as soon as I got my checks, um, my income every month, I knew what was going to go to pay down because this debt was paying at the time maybe 15%, right? Now credit cards are around 20 25%. And in some instances, and that's why I advise everyone to look at their credit card APR, how much is the annual percentage rate you're paying? Some credit cards are even higher between 30% and 40%, which I am shocked that this is even allowed, right? Yeah. But the point is, if you are in debt, look at that, what kind of debt it is, it is, and do a repayment plan. If you look at your income, I want you to think, what are other ways given my talents and skills, that I can increase my income, right? Mm -hmm. And so I help a lot of my clients get raises in their jobs if they are employed. And Mm -hmm. I was so excited this weekend. One of my male clients texted me. He's like, oh, my God, Anna, I have a job opportunity where literally he can earn 70% more. And this is something that, again, when you start to work on your money, you're saying to the universe, hey, I'm here for abundance. I'm here. Bring Mm -hmm. it on. And so many of my clients experience certain things. I was helping him with the lingo and language and steps he should take to proactively approach this potential job. You know, and this is how you know, the income should work. If you're an entrepreneur, okay, what am I charging? Is it in alignment with the quality of the services that I bring, the transformations that I have, you know, and the same, for instance, if you are a stay at home parent listening to this, right, you have so much value and you should consider if you have some time to think about what are the ways that I can have any, you know, income, but also is the, um, what I am bringing to the household, is that being valued? Right. Mm -hmm. And that is important. And by the way, there's tax efficient ways that you can save even if you are not 
having earned income. So again, that's the income lever. The expense lever is an important one. But I do have to say that we're in time of high inflation. And so it's really difficult to lower that expense lever. So instead, we look at the other ones. Okay, taxes. How can I save more on tax by putting away money into my pension or into my retirement and bring down my taxable income, right? So again, for anyone listening, what I want you to do is just sit down and basically know what money you're getting, what money you're paying out, and how can you make new money? Yeah. And I love that. I love that system of analysis of the five different levers that you talk about. That is so interesting. Um, Yeah, no, I really, I think that's really helpful, especially as a starting point for someone who says, okay, I'm ready now to start. Mm. And do you recommend that they just start like, where, where can they access different information? Obviously you are a wealth of knowledge. Is there, are there other, um, resources out there that you recommend that are also like maybe more like accessible to different different people sure so listen today we live in a world where there is so much information online that honestly is it's putting yourself out there and just like searching for information depending the question went like there is no barrier except maybe the digital barrier of you accessing information online right mm-hmm. and so if you don't have good wi-fi or live in a country that doesn't have that ability right but other than that it is accessible um one of the things that i would say is that i want people to think about where do you put your money Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have a bank account, if you are investing, who is your investment manager? So for instance, if you have someone like BlackRock or Vanguard or Hargreaves and Lansdowne, et cetera, you can go into their website. And most of the time they have educational resources. Now, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to vouch for the quality of it because it is, again, this is just um, a little seed I want to share in Plant in the Head is that everything that you read online is general, right? It is not based on your personal circumstances. I'll give you an example. One thing that I think and really bothers me a lot is in social media, when you see these people talking to entrepreneurs and saying like, you know, you have to wake up at 5 a.m. and we all have 24 (laughs) hours in the day and you can achieve if you want to. And I'm going to tell you something, right? First of all, physiologically, not everyone is prepared to wake up at 5 a.m. 100%. 100%. Secondly, right. Um, secondly, is that not everyone has 24 hours in a day. If you are a single mother with three children who have yeah. a career as well, as some of my clients are in that situation, you do not have 24 hours to be free doing everything, right? And so what I want you to, to say is you read that information, you interpret it, and you will tailor it to your personal situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, websites that I do like just to get back to more technical stuff. So first of all, I love Yahoo Finance. I think it is um, a great, great resource that I use daily. I read a lot of their news and information. The Wall Street Journal is another one. I love Mm -hmm. Morningstar. I'm a subscriber. I love their analysis on the markets and on investment. And of course, as you mentioned, you know, there's people such as myself that are financial coaches that work with people at all um, where they are in their learning curve in their financial journey. So again, I think about when you want to learn and change your life, there's two things you need, the ability to learn and the willingness to learn. So if Mm -hmm. your willingness to learn, which is based on your why, why do I want to build wealth is there, you will find a way to learn. I love that. That's amazing. The only, my only, um, the thing with the internet though, is sometimes we have these, um, well, these people who unfortunately are like selling these big dreams. They'll be like, they'll be like, (laughs) do you like, they're standing in front of a Lamborghini and they're like, do you want to like make a million dollars this year? And then you're like, yeah, I do. But obviously not with you. But my question is like, how do we know? You said like you're not vouching for obviously some of this information that you see even on reputable mm. websites. So like, how do, how do people distinguish between like is it the is is it the golden rule of if it sounds too good to be true or is it a mm. like h- how do we navigate all yeah. of these promising big things? Okay, so um. There's a few thoughts there, but number one, I'm a big believer in that. Um, and I've invested a lot of money in my own personal growth and entrepreneurial journey in coaches, for instance, right? And I go, wait a minute, is this person actually living what they're talking about and for how long? Because they'll tell you that a lot of these things, like um, when you have like the Lamborghini or oh, the wealth <laughs> lifestyle, right? Yeah. It's a big difference to be rich than to be wealthy. Rich mm. is short term. Wealthy is long term. Wealthy is 
where you create a legacy and generational wealth for the future. Rich is mm-hmm. where you have fun in life. You might buy expensive things. And you know what? The minute your health suffers or you lose a job, that is gone. Right. And yeah. I saw that. Trust me. I saw it so much during the economic crisis of 06, 07. People living beyond their means for a long time. And these are people earning millions, millions. Yes. Yes. And the minute they were asset rich and liquid and cash poor, boom, they had to sell all those assets. It's a huge discount. Okay. Um, so just to set the tone for that is that, you know, when you read information, understand where is it coming from? Because even if it's coming from a reputable site, who is the journalist? Who is the person mm-hmm. writing it? What kind of life do they live? Are these things that they just kind of got from Warren Buffett, which I see so many social media influencers in the personal finance space that literally repeat the 25 by, you know, 25 times rule, the 4% rule of this. And so much of that no longer exists, actually. And so I want you to think, who is this resource? And so, you know, one of the things that I I was thinking about this, it's funny, Nicole, that I was, um, I'm trying to be more visible on social media myself and do more videos. And I was like, oh, darn, I have to do my makeup. (laughs) (laughs) And I, I let that go. And I literally show up authentically as myself many times without a filter. I didn't even know there were filters on Instagram until probably a month ago. (laughs) Saw Bethany Frankel, you who actually I find her very entertaining, but I was yeah, okay, same. I say, damn, that girl's looking good. <laughs> I read in the comments, someone's like, What filter is that? I'm like, There's filters, all right. So, this is my point. I just want to get the information out there. So, when you are seeing people that have these like beautiful Instagram videos and th- they are spending more money and time on making things aesthetically than the reality of probably the truth of what they're teaching. Yeah, I just say that truthfully, hand on heart, because that's what I see in the space, knowing some of them as well um, in the background. And so I want you to understand, has this person been a living example? I'll tell you, um, you know, I came from a very humble background, very humble, where um, our parents, super bright individuals, my father and my mother were lawyers. Um, My father was second generation to go to university. My mom was first generation. And no one instilled in them the financial knowledge to be good with money, okay? And I will never say my parents were not good with money just like that, but just they were never taught. That is the truth, right? If you're not taught something, how are you expected to know? Um, but the truth is that at a young age, I saw financial challenges and I was like, darn, right? I need to do something about this, literally. Um, and I don't know if I shared the story when you and I first had a, uh, we touched base for the first time. But, you know, when I was 10, I made myself a promise. I'm going to buy them their first home because we did not have a stable home. We had to move sometimes every few months, sometimes every year because rental in- um, rental expenses would go up and they couldn't afford that. And so... And by the way, it is because my parents put any money they had in our education. And that helped me Mm -hmm. to go to a brilliant school. I went to MIT. My brother went to MIT. My sister studied undergrad in Puerto Rico and then went to Harvard um, for a master's. So we all, you know, went to really good institutions, academic institutions, thanks to my parents saying, you know what, we might not have a wealthy lifestyle around, but my kids are going to get the best education because education is freedom. And I'm obsessed. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Same with you. Yeah. 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 Um, But this is the thing. I know what it is to not have, and I know what it is to work to make wealth. And now I have Mm -hmm. properties in the US, in Puerto Rico. I have properties here in the UK. I have um, different wealth assets. I've built my wealth from scratch. No one Mm -hmm. gave me anything. And so when you learn from someone who has been in your shoes, maybe Mm -hmm. who had nothing and they learned, I'd rather learn from that person than from someone who was given a silver spoon and you know, repeat this a hundred percent or it doesn't even, and they just make me, it's like smoke and mirrors. Right. Which is Which very is hard. Very. Yeah. Very, yeah. And you see that honestly in social media so many times it's right. Yeah. Then the, the, we can't let, um, I want you to really like for anyone listening, I want you to, when you see something really ask yourself, is this true? Is this mm-hmm. accurate? And how long is it going to last? Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good advice. Thank you. You um, you just mentioned um, this idea of asset rich, cash poor. Mm. And in your experience, from like a general perspective, do you do you have like a certain formulation that you advise generally, like clients to have in terms of assets versus cash in hand? Because I think sometimes the reason I say that is that I do know there are people who. Um, who just save money, like hoard it almost. Right. And then they have, but they don't maybe do as many investments or if they do invest, it's only in 
like stocks and mutual funds because mm. that's traditionally what they've been told to do. And I, what I've been learning is like obviously diversification into all different sorts of like, not only when you say investments, it could be various different sorts of investments, mm. also like assets, like real assets. And so I'm really trying to, so I'm just wondering when you said that, is it, do you have like a certain formulation that you use for like the general portfolio that someone mm. should have? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Okay. So this is how I view it. Number one, there's something called risk tolerance where I really understand, okay, what is a person's um, ability to withstand changes in fluctuations in their portfolio values, right? And this is important to say, and this is why mindset is important. I work with some high net worth individuals where their mindset and risk tolerance is much more conservative despite them being millionaires. So their net worth is not matching, right, the way they act towards things. And so on the contrary, you have people who don't have a lot of net worth and they are super high risk tolerance and um, making decisions that frankly, you're like, okay, wait a minute, let's take a step back and analyze this. Okay. Yeah. When So I can't say I'm not a believer in the 70-30% portfolio. And when I say that, I don't know if that rings a bell um, to you, but just to our listeners, it means this was a standard in portfolio allocation for many years, which was 70% into equities and 30% into fixed income. And when I say fixed income, think about things such as bonds, although there's a much bigger world and actually fixed income was my expertise for those 20 years. I worked on fixed income trading floors with some of the world's largest investment managers like BlackRock, like Vanguard. Standard life um, on their investment portfolios. And that's why I know a lot about that as well. But that doesn't suit everyone. And you know why? Because it depends on what age are you starting to save money? In what vehicles mm. are they tax advantaged vehicles? And tax advantaged vehicles, I mean things like SIPs, things like ISAs in the UK. In the US, we would call things like a 401k or a Roth IRA. In Canada, right, we would say TFSA or um, RRSP, right? Every country has different tax advantaged vehicles and ways for you to save in a tax efficient manner. Um, so the point is that. I would, when I work with individuals, I look at in general, okay, what is their risk tolerance? What is their current liquidity, right? Ratio. Mm -hmm. Liquidity ratio is a ratio that helps us understand if you lost your job today and had zero income, how long could you survive given your expenses, right? How long could you maintain yourself in a liquid position? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so for me, a healthy liquidity ratio is basically. 12 months. Because the truth is, if we have a health scare, or we have a job situation where we have no income, and many times those come together, we get sick and we can't work. I want you to have an emergency fund that is not invested, mm -hmm. that is highly liquid, meaning I can get that money tomorrow if I need. Okay? okay. And so there's different strategies I tell people about where to put that money to still have it grow because I'm all about growth. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I guess to answer that question is I want people to look at what is the risk tolerance? I want people to look at, okay, if I if I had zero income tomorrow, how much money do I need to set aside? And even if you can't get to 12 months, at least to six months, right, of expenses being paid. And then we're going to be starting about asset allocation and investment. But I want you to prepare the foundations and roots. So imagine a tree. I mm -hmm. want those roots to be really stable. Mm -hmm. So then you can branch out into different asset classes, right? A hundred percent. Oh, that's so good. Oh my God, Anna, you are such a wealth of knowledge. I mean, it's incredible. You're <laughs> well, I'm so passionate good. about it. Thank it's, you. That's so it's sweet. It's coming Thank across you. so well. And I really know that every, I, I'm learning so much. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. So look, before I continue, I need, we need to get the Envisionaire listener questions in. Oh because we yeah, had, let's do it. We had some people who were so excited, um, some listeners who were really excited to hear from you and um, coming from both the UK and Canada. That, which is very nice, so very cross jurisdictional. Yes, and just so you, I appreciate that you reached. You also like you mentioned the uh, TFSA and RSPs. That was a nice shout out to the Canadian listeners. I'm sure they're going to appreciate that. <laughs> good, um, good. Okay. okay, so we have um, one listener who's based in the UK. She okay. is a professor um, mm -hmm. in her 30s. She lives. She's on her like she's single, lives on her own, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she has a couple of questions. The first one. Well, let's just go, we'll just do like do one at a time. So in um, her situation, given that her half of her monthly salary goes to her rent 
and considering the high cost of living in the UK, mm. what would you recommend she does for the rest of like the, the re- remaining um, money that's left in terms of savings? Okay, great. Okay. So there's um, different approaches I want to talk about here. Number one is in general. So you said 50% of her income goes to rent. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you that's very high in personal finance as a rule of thumb. And I say rule of thumb because this is kind of what um, would be healthy in a normal world, but we live, let's say, for instance, this person lives in London, which is going to be a lot more expensive than outside London, right? 50% is very high. And I would ask you to really look at your living arrangements and think about, is this in the best interest for my future self? Because Mm -hmm. sometimes in our current self, we need to make some changes that will help our future self out. So what I mean is a good healthy ratio is 30% of your income should go to rent or mortgage payment, not more. What adjustments could you make to do that? I'll give you an example. Um, When I moved to London, Nicole, in the early 2000s, uh, Credit Suisse was the bank I was employed at. And they, uh, I was on a junior expat, so they paid for the rent of my flat. And I purposefully um, chose a small two-bedroom flat rather than the big one-bedroom flat. Why? Because I rented out the second bedroom. And wow. I rented it out actually, yeah, to my good friend Dino. Shout out to Dino, one of our traders if he hears. I love it. Good mate of mine. And he paid me cash. And wow. with that money, given I was 22 when I moved here and I was on a, on a, on a tight budget because, again, I moved from Manhattan to um, the UK and sterling pound was very, very strong. I was getting paid in dollars because as an expat, you get paid in that currency. So I had to mind a lot of my money. I said, what can I do? Let me make a choice in my living arrangement that will have economic benefit to me. And that's wow. what I did. So I invite your your listener and the person who submitted this question to rethink how could I change this? Could I maybe get another place? And and you know, and I understand in your 30s you're like, oh, maybe I don't want to share a place. Okay, well then can you get a smaller place? Could you yeah. move further out, perhaps? Okay. Um, you know, I want you to think about that. And for this person, I also want to think about those money levers I mentioned. Are you in debt? Is it high interest debt or not? Let's work on that. Do I have some um, emer- an emergency fund? Okay, great. Now, if you're a professor, usually you will be working for a university who will probably give you some type of um, pension, right? Mm that you contribute, contribute, contributory pension. So I want you to also think about when you're thinking about, am I taking advantage of that? Am I paying enough into my pension that I'm getting an employer match, for instance, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, Am I putting money into, and I don't know if this person is um, just UK or has another national nationality, let's just say they're UK based, you know, maybe you want to put money into ISAs. Right. And I can explain that um, if you need. But the point is, I want you to think about number one, let's get that rental payments down. Let's mm-hmm. rethink how else I can make money as a professor. Maybe you could be doing tutoring. Maybe you could be doing some online digital course, teaching your students some variety of the activities that you teach to get that income lever. So think about that income um, expense lever, the debt lever, yeah. savings and taxes, and how you can improve on them. Yeah, amazing. That's such good advice. I think if if um I do think she is she's dual. Like so I think so she lives um she's originally from Turkey. And so okay. I think that there's probably but maybe I'll let her reach out directly to you um yeah. on Instagram if she wants to further discuss the ISA dis- discussion with you. I yeah. think that'd be great. Okay. Um well hopefully that answered um her question. Great. Second question was about considering the length of mortgage repayments. Okay. How does one decide what is the ideal time period? For example, 15-year mortgage versus 30-year mortgage. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Totally. Okay. So number one is, let's think about it from a mathematical standpoint. Anything that you have for a shorter time will save you money on interest, usually. Okay. A 15-year mortgage at the end of the life, if you're able to pay for it, right, it's going to save you money on interest rather than paying for 30 years, of course, depending on the interest rate level. But in general math, that's the case. However, what happens? Your monthly payments are going to be higher in a 15-year mortgage than in a 30-year mortgage. So I want you to be aware of your situation. How secure is your job? How are you managing your cash flow? Are you able to cover the mortgage if you lost your job and for how long? Are you able to deal with those larger payments? Because if the answer is yes, 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 Anna, then I would say, okay, let's consider the 15-year mortgage. Mm -hmm. Now, 
one thing that I invite you to think about if you're like, yeah, Anna, you're right. I don't know. The world is changing. I don't know how secure my job is. The other thing you can do is choose a 30-year mortgage or a 20-year mortgage. Some financial instit institutions offer that. But I want you to think, is there a prepayment clause penalty? Mm. So if there's a clause, then what's the penalty? I'll give you an example. I have a 15-year mortgage. I have, I think, around 11 years left on mine. Um, and I made sure that the mortgage I got had no prepayment penalty, meaning that I could, whenever I had income coming that was extra, put it towards the principal. So then I'm lowering my uh, principal that I owe. So that's a strategy you can think about as well Is say, okay, you know what, let me go for the longer, but make sure that I myself am going to try to pay it as soon as possible. And so let me see what the prepayment penalty is. So I would invite you to think about that. And also, um, the other point of view of 15 year versus uh, 30 years, what are your financial goals? Mm -hmm. And by that, I'll give you an example. Okay. When you are able to lower your monthly payments, mm -hmm. okay, so let's say that the difference was a thousand pounds just to, to visualize something or a thousand dollars between a 50 monthly payment between the 15 year and 30 year. Okay. Well, what if I go for the 30 year, what am I going to do with that extra thousand that I'm saving right now? Mm, are we going to yeah. be strategic and invested into assets that will help us build wealth? Because friends, the way we build wealth is putting money into wealth building assets, whether that is property, stocks, shares, um, crypto, whatever you want. Again, crypto, I don't invite you to think too much about that right now, but I just put it out there. It is an asset class. Um, I want you to really think about, but then hold yourself accountable. Okay, I'm going to go for the 30 year to save X amount per month, but then I'm going to put that money to work. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, great advice. Okay. And then the third question she had was in the UK, is it a good idea to have an ISA to use the ISA vehicle alongside other pension schemes? So presumably yeah. she does have the pension from, from the university. Oh, yeah. Good, good. Okay. So this is, um, and again, this is fully for solely for people that are UK residents and, and, and taxpayers in the UK. If you are a dual citizen, meaning US, UK listening to this, you cannot invest in ISAs. The IRS views them as something very bad called Pass a Foreign Income Corporation, and you do not want to put your money into an ISA. So let's refocus now on people who can actually invest in an ISA. First question is, what age are you? Because if you're between the age of 18 and 39, you can put your money into a beautiful thing called LISA, Lifetime Individual Savings Account, of which the government will top it up 25% a year oh. up to a thousand pound total. So just in general, for those listening who are like, hey, hey, what did she say? ISA, it's an individual savings account. It is a beautiful tax efficient tool in the UK where basically you take after tax money and you invest it and you can invest it either just in cash and that's called a cash ISA. You can invest it into stocks and shares ISA. And then there's other types like innovative finance ISA, et cetera. But let's just focus on the cash ISA and on the um, stocks and shares ISA. So you take your after-tax money and you put it into one of these vehicles. Any growth that happens in those vehicles is going to be tax-free. You're not going to have to pay any interest uh, tax on the interest you earn. You're not going to pay any taxes on the dividends nor on capital appreciation. It is so beautiful. And more than anything, and again, that's why we need to know our financial goals, is you can access your ISAs at any time. With a pension, you can only do it after 55 and in fact, um, usually people should wait until later to keep that compounding interest growing in their portfolios. However, I love pensions for one specific thing. When you get to the age of 55, and that's going to be going up, I believe, to 58 next year, you're able to get 25% tax-free of your pension out. So you're putting pre-tax money into a pension, maybe matched by your employer, hopefully it is. And when you get to that age, you can take 25% out tax-free. So it's you're saving a lot of money on it. It's very tax-savvy, right? Um, yes. But then you can't really access that money, as I say, as you can with an ISA. So I do believe in a strategy mm -hmm. of both, both things, putting money into a pension and putting money into an ISA because you have different liquidity. You mm -hmm. have different ability to save on taxes. And mm -hmm. also you have the ability to grow your money. Because compound interest is our friend. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, that leads into a nice um, a nice question that we have from a Canadian uh, young, younger listener and visionaire. She's in her Love early it. 20s. Mm -hmm. 
and she had a couple of questions as well. The first one was about the standard kind of, I have, I get my paycheck, right? How much should I actually be saving? And I, so what is the sort of proportion, if you will, of, of savings versus, you know, actually enjoying life and wanting to travel, if you will? That's great. So I just want to say to this listener, well done for starting to think about your financial well-being at such a young age. That's brilliant. Okay. So um, one, again, rule of thumb, it doesn't apply for everyone, but I'm going to teach you something. I want you to take your annual savings that you, you make in a year, and I want you to divide it by your annual gross income and multiply it by 100. Okay. Again, annual savings over annual gross income times 100. That will give you a ratio. If your ratio is between 15 to 20%, meaning that you're saving around 15 to 20% of your annual income, right? Mm -hmm. That is very positive. Some people are not able to save that much, but I do want to um, highlight that 15 to 20% includes any employer matching that you're getting. So actually you can get there more easily than you think. So that would be a good rule of thumb. But again, there are seasons in our financial life. And I know that, um, you know, someone who is 22 is uh, probably starting a new season in their career and their profession profession may have student loans and may have certain expenses where maybe it's only going to be 5%. And that's okay, right? Just, I want you to aim to that 15 to 20%. So can we go through like a worked experience, like a, an example, because I am, um, I just like examples and I'm so tell. It can be like a standard, <laughs> it can be like a standard, like just a general kind of overview of what you just, that formula, because it's very, it's, it's yeah, it sounds so- very good. Okay. So when you think about it, and by the way, I said annual because I don't like to look at savings on a monthly basis necessarily. And this is the only reason why. It's because in a year, if you're an entrepreneur, for example, there is seasonality to the income that you make, right? Um, If you are in a standard job where you are getting paid the same every month, then it's a lot easier to automate your expenses and make sure that when your money comes in, you automatically put out maybe, you know, 10%, 20% of that into a savings um, account. And from there, it will go into another pathway, whether that is to fund your emergency fund, your ISA, your Roth IRA, whatever. Um, or traditional IRA that you Mm -hmm. want. Now, if we look at an example, and this is why it's hard to put tangible numbers on it because we would need to understand what someone pays, for example, in rent or mortgage. But as I said, a good rule of thumb is that when you get your income, like 30% will go to rent um, or to, it's around, so if you look at it a bit like the third, I don't like the third, third, third rule. And in fact, I don't even like um, the 50, 30 20 rules so much, which basically says of your income, 50% should go to your living expenses. That includes rent, going out, food. This was made by Elizabeth Warren, by the way. This Then it says that 30% should be going to having fun and to you know, um, living life. And then 20% should go to savings. I think that 20 and 30% should be flipped. I think you should be aiming to save around the 30% if you're, if you can. And that means when I say saving again, it's into those buckets of emergency fund, short, medium, long-term goals. And then 20% should be really used in the fun things. Mm. Um, what I will tell you, let's just put this into something concrete in my own life to, to, to let you know, there's two things that help me build wealth in life. Number one, was always being strategic in my work and knowing the minute that my job description no longer matched my former job description, meaning that my role was expanded, I made sure that my salary increased with it. And if it didn't, I would find another place that would honor my value. Okay. I always asked in life that helped me build wealth. Um, Number two, because I got paid more, I was able to put more into my savings, et cetera. Okay. Number two was I knew my financial behavior. And I know that if I have it in the bank account, I'm like, yeah, let's celebrate. (laughs) So I purposefully used automation to the the minute. So if if I got paid on the 15th of the month, on the 16th, I would have a certain percentage automatically be deducted and go into savings account. Okay. Mm -hmm. Out of sight, out of mind for me. That helped me build wealth. Yeah. Number three, whenever I bought a property, and as I mentioned, I, I've been very blessed that I own multiple properties. Not all of them are rented out. Some of them are just for pure joy and to help my family and for me to have a place when I go home, right? Because I do believe we have to enjoy as well in life. Um, I really did this. I thought to myself, 
if I lost my job tomorrow, could I afford this mortgage for three to five years? Wow. Right. So what does that tell you is that I always made sure to live below my means and to buy assets that were not putting the financial pressure on me of if I lost my job for three to five years, which is a big time to allow me to find a job that's equal or higher in pay. Okay. Because I didn't want that pressure. And I remember perfectly in 2005, oh, I found a dream property in Puerto Rico. It was a gorgeous dream, like one of those dream properties you envision. And I remember going through my finances and going, oh, can I do it? Yes. But not following that three to five year rule that I had imposed on myself. I bought a less expensive home and I thank God because you know what came next, 2006 and seven, where I would have lost 50% of that property. Wow. And the pressure of me and this financial stress that would have caused me would not have been healthy. So I want you to know yourself and know what triggers you. Yeah. And for me, safety is important. I hope that's Oh my fine. gosh. A hundred percent. And not only that, I mean, what you said about this idea of almost valuing yourself enough to be able to leave a job that doesn't honor you. That is huge because huge. I'm hearing about that. I talk about it with my friends and it's such a common thing, especially I think as we are now, like some of my friends, we're in our thirties and forties mm-hmm. and you get to a point where it feels like when you were in your twenties, um, you always had someone who was looking out for you um, above if you're in a job. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you get into your thirties and forties and nobody's doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. And you're almost like, you really have to advocate for yourself because mm-hmm. no one else is going to do it. And that's been, a, that for me, that's been a really big life lesson in my thirties is like, you have to advocate for yourself, especially yeah. like, I'm going to say definitely in the, in the work environment, because mm-hmm. If you don't, like nobody's going to remember all of the things that you did and why you are valuable and why you deserve that, that, that increase. It's, it's very, um, amen to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's I'm going to share with you this statistic. And again, this was, um, in university of Illinois, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the lady who ran this, but basically she did a study that said in your first job. And, um, if you, if you, if you would be able to negotiate just $5,000 more, at the end of a career, how much does that translate into? And it was $750,000 from a $5,000 negotiation, right? I've actually read other studies that say it's more 1 million to 1.5 because you take in count, um, you know, how'd you save the money, the compound interest, also the money you put into your um, retirement accounts, et cetera. But this is my point to anyone listening that is in a workspace uh, sorry, full-time employment, like a, a work environment. Um, I want you to think about who can I find that is going to be my sponsor, mm. not mentor. Yes. A sponsor is someone who says your name in a room full of opportu- opportunities, who knows yes. your value and advocates for you. And as women, we need a sponsor, right? 100%. Of course, a sponsor will also mentor you a bit, but it's a very different game. So think yes. about, yeah, that. I, I 100% agree. I think that was... Yeah, that was a struggle that I had. Um, I didn't have that in certain work environments and it was really detrimental. And I think particularly in, let's say the law firm environment in the Mm. city, which is very like, well, and you've worked in those financial institutions that it's, it's very patriarchal, but also hierarchical and being a woman, a woman of color, a woman of the different accent, you're just like, yeah. <laughs> who's going to sponsor you? Yeah. But it's hard. It's really hard. And it's so important. I've noticed that like the people who end up getting to like the partnership in the, yes. it's because they get to go in, they get to be invited to the things where there's only one associate they can bring and right. they get to, they get to, you know, um, they get to get the bonuses at the end of the year. They get to, there's right. lots of things and it's, mm-hmm. it's sponsorship a hundred percent, like the most important thing. I think if you're going to succeed in those environments, thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't just become an entrepreneur, then <laughs> By the way, though, even as an entrepreneur, you are the sum of who you surround yourself with. So as an yes. entrepreneur, find those buddies that are like, you know what? We want to succeed financially. We want our business to be a business and not a hobby. Yeah, a hundred percent. But also the people. And and with that, I would also say like something I've learned is you really must surround yourself with people who are generous of spirit. If Mm. if you are, if you are. So like, I am a very generous of spirit person. I love to see the people around me succeed when they're winning. I'm winning. Like we, Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of my, uh, Brene Brown 
um Long she talks Brita about this Brown. oh I know she's so good and she's referenced um one of my best friends um we've talked about this and and many times about and this one quote that she shared which says like you want to make sure that um the people you surround yourself with don't blow out your your light so if you are like a light you want to make sure that the friends around you or the people around you actually protect your light so it's not blown out whereas there are people who will actually try and blow it out or look while someone else is blowing out your light and that's really really important and I advocate that as well to a lot of them what's so interesting we just came full circle to the question you had asked me about what if your environment whether that be family friends or is not supporting your Mm -hmm. financial mindset we just came around. This is what, this is what, don't let them blow out your light. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Love it. See. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I think that's answered uh, the question. So Shania and Gak Chen, thank you so much for, uh, for bringing those questions in. Nice. Really appreciate that. We're on the final segment of the Envisionaire questionnaire um, of the podcast. So thank you so much, uh, Anna, so far for being with us. It's been so great. But now we're going to turn to you and um, about, yeah, personal reflections for okay. Anna. And we're going to ask you three questions uh, looking back at your past, present, and future. Okay? okay. So starting with looking back towards your past, if you could give yourself at 15 years old any advice, what would it be? At 15. All right. I actually visualized myself. I was a um, sophomore in high school. Yeah. It would be. Trust your instincts because you're very, very bright. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's not a measure of IQ of intelligence. It's that inner gut feeling that we feel. Trust it more. And secondly, learn to work smarter and not harder. Because I worked so hard and I (laughs) should have been working smarter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But you know what? That's probably there is that sort of block of like, as I've been reading about mindset as well, and this idea Mm. that like, oh, things come so easy. Like they, you know, sometimes people have, we have this mindset that it shouldn't be that easy to succeed. It shouldn't be that easy to get things. But actually, if you like, that's, that's actually like a scarcity mindset in a way. And we actually have to say, actually, no, like things do come to me easily. And I can find like, shortcuts and it doesn't mean I'm being bad or naughty or whatever it just right. means I'm being smart right yeah. so 100 yeah. percent. that's a limiting belief if you think mm. that it has to be hard and I started this year with that um really so by the way I left this book next to me so I could show it to you I does it um by Chris I haven't seen that oh no. one of my favorite books as you can see tons of little post-it notes because I share it a lot with I, I mean I read it I share it with my clients but um, I really started working on myself for 2024 and things have just been, thank God, coming my way. And I'm a big believer, the more you have, the more I give. And that is driving, but that mindset. So again, I'm starting to find ways to work smarter and not harder in my business. And so um, it's it's coming to fruition. So set your abundance hat on. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. (laughs) Amazing. Great. Okay. And looking towards the present moment, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world tonight, who would it be? Oh, how fun. Oh, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So I'm going to say two answers. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, no. If if it could be actually reality, someone who's living and breathing, who I love and adores Oprah Winfrey. I know. Oh. Oh. How can you not love Oprah? So good. <laughs> but so she good. is someone who especially, you know, lived at a time where limitation was everywhere as a woman of color, as a woman, as someone from a poor background. And look where she is today. Yeah. And also because she is one of the first people who embodied mindset and holistic wellness, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so I have to say Oprah Winfrey for that. But then on the other hand, I would say my mother who is in heaven, I would love to have her and have dinner tonight, but Aww. I can't talk too much because I'll cry. <laughs> it makes me want to cry. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. That's but nice. you know, cause my mother was one of the most wise people that I ever met and there's so many things I would want her guidance on now that I can't mm-hmm. get. But I can because I pray. I'm a woman of faith. So I do pray and I say, help me get those divine downloads that will help me make the best decisions. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) No, I think that's so beautiful. And I'll tell, I'll share something with you because I remember um, talking to you again, one of my best friends. um, And she said to me when my father passed, I said, I'm just a little bit sad because um, I feel like I'm not going to get 
to talk, to ask him the things mm. that we used to talk about, the wisdom. the Because he was like, a, I like to say, like my mother, beautiful, amazing person. And she's so, she's my teacher in life mm-hmm. in so many ways. Beautiful. My dad was my spiritual teacher, I like mm. to say. So like very different, you know, such, yeah. I'm so grateful I had both, right? Yeah, yeah. But my dad, the spiritual stuff, I was like, mm, I'm sad that I'm not to get that, access that anymore. And then she said, no, but the, all the answers are already in you. So mm. you don't even, uh, and I just was like, oh, how beautiful. thank you. That was, so that was Stephanie. And thank you, Stephanie. She really, that was so oh. beautiful what she said. Cause that is true. Like they've, true. they've, they've already imparted everything. So yes. Yes. it's there. Yeah. Yes. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to like start crying. <laughs> I know, okay. I know. It's hard. I'll tell you, and you know, for anyone listening who has lost a parent, if they had a good relationship, they'll understand. But mm-hmm. um, it's a very hard thing to understand until it happens to you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, future looking, what is mm-hmm. one goal that you would like to achieve in the next five years that you want to share with us? I have so many, but let's break it down to one. I want to be an uh, international best-selling author. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. I am that. currently, my first children's book was published in 2022, and I'm already working on other manuscripts, um, not only for children, but also for the adult market, because as, as you can imagine, I'm passionate about financial wellness, so I want to get oh, my so. journey tips and advice out there for people to read in a book, God willing. Oh my gosh, you should 100% do it. You are so good. Like, it's so clear. And also the fact that you come with this very much more holistic approach. I love that. I love it so much. And I think you could, you could just, there's so many lessons that you've gone through in your personal life. Um, and also like from faith as well. Like, I think there's just so much to bring and I think it'd be beautiful. So I would definitely be buying it, pre-ordering that one for sure. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much again, Anna, for being on the podcast. You have been so generous with all of your advice and I really appreciate that. And I know the listeners will as well. And this is such a great episode. So thank you so much. And for those, uh, and for those that want to connect with you and learn more, I do know you have a free guide to smart Mm -hmm. investing. So I'll put the link to that. If you want to talk about that a little bit, and then also share with you, like how we can connect with you on socials. Thank you. And and firstly, thank you for having me here. I enjoy you have such a beautiful energy. I loved this conversation. And I'm so glad shout out to Lori Lynn that put us in touch. I mean, Lori, <laughs> you're amazing. You're amazing. Yeah. So um, yes, I have basically shared a it's a free PDF guide. It's around eight to nine pages. And it's just basically, if you're thinking of investing, it really is covering some of the important steps that you have to take before. And so I think mm-hmm. it's, you know, um, going to be full of knowledge, hopefully helpful. And once you sign up, you sign up to my email list. I email around once or twice a week, helpful, tangible, practical um, things from news to things I've, you know, again, in a holistic way of about finances and also about important things that you want to be kept up to date um, in different topics. So hopefully that is helpful to listeners. And I can be found, um, my website is just like my Instagram. Instagram at where your money crown. So my website's where your money crown.com. There's also other resources on the website. If you go to the resources tab and yeah, people can connect with me. Probably Instagram is the best. Although on Facebook, I'm also at where your money crown. Yay. I'm going to put all the links in the oh, show notes you. and thank you so much, Anna. You've been such a star. So thank you so much. Thank you. Gracias. Lots of love. Thanks everyone for listening to the Envisionair podcast. Make sure that you like and subscribe to this podcast so that you stay up to date.